Gardening promises to be more popular than ever this season with folks at home to stay safe from coronavirus. Our garden experts are home too, but standing by to share their expertise and inspire us to get growing. Great gardening is straight ahead. We're like producing a serious amount of food. We hope to be able to provide food for the community. I love sharing the garden with others. You can do a lot of fun things with broccoli. All of our students here are involved in gardening. It has a sign on the door that says my happy place and it really is. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish and I'm here with horticulturist and educator Bob Olin and garden professional Deb Burns Erickson. And we are recording the show from our homes where we're sheltering in place due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Nice to see you two and share the screen with you. I trust you're both well. We're doing very well. A little different experience, but uh, it's been great so far. Exciting. This is exciting. Great. Well, we want to let viewers know that we'll, we will be answering garden questions that came in earlier via email, but please keep those questions coming. You can send them to ask at wdse.org and you'll see that address at the bottom of your screen. Um, because, you know, we're going to keep at this and uh, we need more questions for our experts who are so gracious to be here to answer them. Well, we're all anxious to talk about what's popping out in nature and in our gardens. Bob, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing out there. Well, it's still very early in the season. The snow is obviously being melted daily, very quickly. But up over the hill and farther north of the county in shaded areas, there's still quite a bit of snow. So uh, things are beginning to emerge. Uh, the buds on a lot of our apple trees are still pretty tight. So if people didn't have an opportunity to get out and do some dormant pruning, that's still an opportunity. But we can kind of tell day by day and week by week, uh, spring is unfolding. It sure is. And I know, Bob, that um, before I get to, to Deb here, I know that you all sent some shoots of garlics coming, garlic coming up. That's what we saw in those shoots, right? It's kind of fun, yes. Uh, they went in very late in the year, actually, third week in November, but you got to get them in the fall, and they're, they're jumping through the mulch layer, and uh, they're getting ready to go. So that's certainly one of the first signs of spring. Okay. Deb, tell us how everything's coming up in the greenhouse and the progress there. I see some lovely plants behind you. Right. Well, we start everything in January, so this hasn't impacted us. We feel like we're just going forward as planned. I mean, our vegetable, our celery, I swear we could harvest celery today, but uh, wow. our vegetables are up. Everything is up. Everything is just, this sunlight has been incredible this spring. You can't duplicate what sun can do inside a greenhouse and for mm -hmm. plants. It's amazing. So all the, you know, fingers crossed, it's all going to go according to schedule. Right. Well, um, that sounds great. I did get out in the yard yesterday and I did see some rhubarb starting to push out just a little bit. There was snow around it, but it just was poking its head out. And then the other thing um, that I saw was a lot of snow mold. Bob, can you said you shared some pictures of that that we're going to show right now. Can you tell us what to do about that and why we're seeing so much of it? Well, we're probably seeing so much of it because we had that very heavy early snowfall and uh, we never melted any of it down. So we had that blanket of wet, moist snow on top of the uh, turf. We do have two types. We've got a gray snow mold and a pink snow mold. They're both fungi. What you're seeing there in that webbing are the mycelia or the fruiting bodies. Uh, the wonderful thing is it's not a very aggressive fungi. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Maybe when the snow melts, just a very light rake with a broom rake, and it shouldn't be a major problem. Okay. And you say, should we be waiting to kind of get to rake that out? I generally advise that people stay off the, the wet, moist areas. Let, let the snow melt and let some of the extra moisture drain off. It'd be pretty damaging spending a lot of time and a lot of compaction and compression on the lawn or other areas where there's a lot of moisture. I'd give it a little bit of time and then uh, never a garden rake but just a light broom rake and take a little bit of the litter and a little bit of the uh, residue from the winter off the top of the grass not raking down into the actual rhizomes or the root material of the plants. 
Okay, great advice. Well, you guys, this week we're talking about community gardens and being a part of that. So we want to take a look at this. Here's one example of how community gardening is being done in Duluth. My name is Julie Allen. I'm the site coordinator and a gardener here at the Hillside Community Garden, which is one of 21 gardens that is operated by the Duluth Community Garden Program. You can't really Google gardening questions all the time. Google doesn't have all the answers and the best way is to talk to fellow gardeners who know how to garden in Duluth in our climate and who have been at a specific garden for a long time so they know the nuances of where a new person is trying to garden for example. There's about 10 of us um, that all garden here so we've all paid you know, paid to rent a plot. This year, we're trying out something different because we've had a lot of turnover of gardeners and, and therefore like a degrading quality to the individual plots. And so what we decided to do is, instead of each gardener having their own individual plot, which was usually like a 20 by 20 area, we are communally managing this whole space together. And so it was seven individual plots is now our little mini urban farm with 10 different people that are all participating. In the past, it was everybody had their one or two or five tomato plants in their plot. But this year it's like all of our tomatoes are in one row. All of our onions are in three rows over there. And so that allows us to grow much more efficiently and use the space more effectively. It's just it's been really satisfying for people to because we're not we're like producing a serious amount of food more already more food than the 10 of us can handle. The winter squash seems really happy. We have another really great crop of garlic. We just harvested the scapes off of our garlic and we'll be harvesting the garlic later in the summer. We're harvesting peas right now, shelling peas, sugar snap peas and snow peas and that's really fun. You know, and honestly, like I love all the food, but I'm also just crazy about flowers. And I'm really happy that my flowers are doing well this year. I have red poppies that I'm so in love with. And then a lot of perennial or self-seeding stuff. Some of us are still learning how to actually be gardeners, which isn't just the work, but changing the way that we eat and cook and all of that. We have workshops and events and a tool library. Um, to allow people to get what they need in order to garden. But the most important part of that is knowing other gardeners, as you know, um, because that's where the real learning and the real the connection happens. Well, most of Duluth's community garden pl plots are individual sites, and they're in, in larger gardens. They're usually about 20 by 20, so plenty of room there for social distancing and plenty of space to, to grow a lot of food. And to find out more, go to the website on your screen or connect to the link on our website at WDSE.org. Okay, you guys, it's time for some questions. And um, fortunately, we've had a lot of people emailing questions in. And uh, so we got some stuff to work with here. Are you ready? Um, it's, this one is um, about dogwood trees, and it is, we talked about this, Bob, this woman is doing some landscaping around her lake home and wants to get rid of dogwood trees. Cut, she cut back the growth, but can't dig the roots out to all of the ledge rock there and is wondering how to get rid of it so it won't grow back. That's from Carol. Okay, that's going to be a real challenge for her. I think that uh, she might have a couple of options. I would cut the plant back, and these are sh shrubs, of course, and uh, then on the reemergence uh, shrubs or the, or the sprouts, I would, she's got a couple options. She can cover them with some kind of real heavy material. I actually like to use carpet liner. Uh, you just can't let those reemerging sprouts hit the daylight at any time or they'll recharge the root. She'll fight that forever. The other option she could use is uh, some kind of a brush killer if she elected to do that. 
uh, following the label, there are a number of products out there that could be used, but I would probably cut them back first and make a, make a fall application of one of the uh, brush killer products, and that should be uh, successful for her. She needs to be very conscious of any water uh, drainage down in any water system and be very careful. She mentioned it at a lake home, so she has to use very good discretion if she's using any kind of a uh, weed control product. Okay, great. Um, this next one comes from Diane and Craig. And Deb, they're wondering, will garden centers be open this spring? We know yours will. So uh, just tell us about what, what you're doing to kind of uh, counter these strange conditions for everybody. Right, I mean, most garden centers, and at least we have um, information from the South, what they're doing. They're doing curbside pickup. They're doing drive-through. Um, some of the exempt ones, um, which we're hoping to become an exempt one where we could actually have limited numbers of customers coming in and um, limited cart, lim limited interaction. But um, I mean, spring is our big time. So we have to do something to adjust. It might be a longer spring for people. You know, don't get, everyone's going to be so excited to garden this spring because they, they have lots of time to do it, but also to realize, you know, maybe get started and it might be longer for them to install everything and to get everything growing. Like doctors on call said, do three things a day to focus on, you know, uh, today I'm doing dahlias, impatience, and alyssum. And just to keep yourself a little bit sane and um, just to give yourself more time and make this spring more normal or as normal as we can make it. Right. All right, great. Let's see, Paul from Duluth says, when I picked my Honeycrisp apples last fall, they were filled with brown blotches on the inside and were not as large as usual. What can I do to prevent this from happening again this year? Um, Paul's call, uh, writing from Duluth. Bob, do you want to take that one? Certainly, you know, Honeycrisp is an absolutely great apple. It's gone throughout the world and introduction from the University of Minnesota. Got to thank Dave Bedford for his hard work on it, that introduction. One of the faults that it does have is it has this characteristic water core problem where the cell structures, particularly in storage, will break down and it's that collapsing cell structure that's causing this degeneration and the browning that he's seeing. There's really very little he can do about it, certainly not uh, in the field where they're being grown. If he's storing them, he wants to watch his temperatures very carefully and you wanna be 35 to 40 degrees in higher relative humidities for storage. But a lot of that is just dependent upon the type of year we're having and the way the fruit is setting up and growing. Okay, excellent. Um, you know, I do have other questions coming from people about the greenhouses being open and will they be able to sell tomato, broccoli, kale, herbs, other vegetable plants for gardens? If not, where can people buy them? But I think that's where you need to buy them, right? You can, I mean, some of the box stores are being allowed to, you know, like um, the Home Depots and have more essential different things, but still watching your social distancing, um, right, we're gonna have to figure something out in the garden centers because we have it, I don't know how, and we don't ship it. So there's not a lot of, you know, other things touching it, other people touching it. And we run, you know, soap and water throughout the greenhouse all the time so we can keep things pretty clean um, and garden centers can and, and help support your local garden centers because this could be a really tough spring on them. Yeah, um, Bob, well, apparently the, the St. Paul Farmers Market is declared like a grocery store so it can be open. What about the Duluth Farmers Market? Do we know yet? Well, I think because we're in uh, food production and distribution, we'll be open. We'll have a set of real rigid guidelines in terms of how the product can be handled, number of people that can be in the building. So there will be a number of restrictions, but uh, we're definitely gonna be open. We're food producers. If I could take the opportunity to just dovetail on what Deb had to say about uh, sourcing locally, I think it's really important that we do support our, our local greenhouses because they're really planting varieties that are well adapted for this particular area. We are so far north, we're a smaller market area. A lot that may be distributed through larger outlets uh, are just varieties that are uh, well known to be grow throughout the country, but it's very important for success that we select varieties that are grown for this area. 
the results are going to be much better uh, if you do shop locally from your local smaller greenhouses, I would say. Uh, more about community gardens now. In Superior, they've seen school and church community gardens. In fact, a new church one was started last season. And now for the first time, there's also a community garden space for residents to rent plots and learn from their garden neighbors. We are in Superior, Wisconsin. Um, it's the, I always say it's the 2300 block of Oaks Avenue. The, the garden, of course, doesn't have an address, but, and then I also say it's, it's next to Golden Apartment. We're creating um, Superior's first community garden, well, for, for rental plot. Residents will be able to rent plots to grow their own food. Um, you know, if, especially if they don't have their own space, you know, they live in an apartment or they live in a small lot um, where they don't have room to, to grow food. So we know too that, you know, flowers and plants and anything to bring in, in the um, pollinators is a good thing. So that we will have um, those too. We plan on having at least um, 25 to 30 plots here of various sizes. They could even rent a plot together. Um, depends on how much food they want to grow. Apple trees um, on that end, um, berries, grapevines are all part of the plan. And at this end then, we will have raised beds for um, people to rent. In the future, we want to put a small gazebo in here because our plan too is we're going to hold workshops to educate um, the community. I was talking to um, to the building trades about this community garden, and um, and of course, you know they have the skills that as far as you know the building skills, and so um, so they said they would partner, you know, partner with us to um, to build the fence for us, and um, and hopefully later on the gazebo. We are really fortunate to have skilled you know, labor, all volunteer. We want this to be here, you know, as part of the neighborhood for a long time. It's like, like the community gardens of old, where you bring the community together to, to grow good food and to learn from each other. My name is Don Johnson. I'm a, a member here at Faith United Methodist Church. Uh, we are working on a community garden we hope to be able to provide food for the community, uh, a place for community members to get together uh, and share a, an experience uh, that some of us find very pleasurable, uh, working with soil, uh, growing our own food. It will be available to the community for people who are short of food. These need to be about an inch deep. That, that's, that's plenty deep. We're planting peas in this one, about three, four inches apart. Work together and one row support the other. Kind of like we all should do, support each other. So um, check out their website and or their Facebook page to find out more about community gardening in Superior. Okay, we wanna get back to some more questions, you guys. Um, there's one here from Diane and Craig, who also asked about the garden centers, but they also wanna know if we could address the damage that was done to trees and shrubs from the heavy snowfall event, events that we had, and then how to prune to you know, help that. We did have quite a bit of heavy snow earlier there, and we see this just about every year. It's a great time right now because this is when you want to be pruning up deciduous uh, trees and shrubs prior to bud break. So just take a little look. Anything that's damaged, uh, you want to prune out. And I always suggest that you always want to prune back to something. You want to prune back to a bud, or you want to prune back to another leader or stem. You don't want to leave any stumps out there, so you don't want to prune halfway between two buds. You prune about a uh, eighth to a quarter of an inch above a bud. So it's a great time to evaluate things. I would do this in the next week or so because the spring is coming very quickly, 
and uh, pretty soon those buds are going to begin to break and you want to get them pruned before they do break. Okay. Um, Deb, speaking of spring coming quickly, um, I have a viewer from International Falls who's in zone three says, when should I start my sunflower and marigold seeds indoors or should that already have been done? Those are both very quick growers, very quick to germinate. She has plenty of time to do that. And yes, this spring has been incredible for germination and propagation. And so she's got plenty of time. Even if you could do like a few now, just get a few started just and see how they do and maybe get some, get your learning curve flattened out a little bit so that you know how they germinate. You can take care of fewer, easier, because you could then layer in um, uh, repeat seedings, maybe some uh, seedings in the beginning of May, and then some direct seeding in June so that you have different color at different times. Well, there's some beautiful blooms from Britt and Hibbing, Minnesota in this week's Grow and Show. Let's take a look. Janet Eicholtz of Britt is planning and planting for this season with an eye to last year's gardens, where the mock orange shrubs glowed white beyond a stand of purple foxglove. Janet says last season's roses were spectacular, and here's the proof. But she also shares a photo of a patch of pink lady slippers growing nearby, noting that Mother Nature's garden still can't be beat. And Brenda Suzik of Hibbing is so looking forward to the blooms of her white lilac, which she says makes double flowers that look to her like popcorn. Brenda says the butterflies love them too. If you have beloved blooms or impressive vegetation, send us the pictures to prove it and let us show what you grow. Keep those pictures coming in, you guys. Um, it's just so joyful to see all the beautiful blooms that everybody grew last season and, and fun to see things that are poking out right now, but um, love to have those pictures coming from gardeners and viewers so that we um, can share them and look at them and, and uh, start thinking about positive growing. Um, so we just have a little more time for questions and um, Deb, I know you have a, a, an idea for people who are really anxious to get uh, get something in a pot or get out there and uh, and really start putting together something that looks pretty, right? Um, they could if they don't get overzealous and cleaning up too much. But when you're cleaning and you have like a nice size uh, root mass and like in a, this is a Japanese painted fern or hookara, and if they're starting to come up, you can break up an outer section of that. Um, of that root mass and then put it into a pot. We put them into hanging baskets. It gives you some color. It gives you some control, um, something pretty. You could even seed a marigold with it, you know, for a little color right now and then transplant them apart, you know, when you're, when you can get out into the garden and really work it. Okay. And Bob, there are things, um, we've talked a little bit about this, but there are things you should definitely be doing now and things that you just got to wait on. Yeah, I really think you can just uh, walk around your yard or your property and just survey things. And if there is winter damage, uh, prune those things up, get the pruning shears out, get that done uh, right now. And then you might even want to split up rhubarb. You mentioned your rhubarb is coming up as long as the shoots have emerged. Uh, you can separate those out and uh, that can be very beneficial. And as soon as you can get it uh, started in the spring with that, the, the better the growing season is and, and the more successful you're going to be there. So a few things that can be done, but stay off the lawn that's so wet right now at this point. I think we have time for one more quick one. Either of you can answer this. Um, Roberta, who lives in sand country, planted new lilac bushes three years ago. They're growing but not blooming. What kind of soil do they need? Does it need to be neutral or acidic or is that the issue? Don't you think, Deb, that uh, lilacs are so adaptable? Frankly, um, anything around neutrality or slightly acidic is going to be fine. That's not the issue. The issue, it's a very young plant. It's in the juvenile form. It has to get more to an adult form. Give it a little bit more time, a few more years, and it should bloom for you. Yeah, when they come in, it depends on the right. Oh, I'm sorry, Deb. Go ahead. And a little bit depends upon the variety, because some of them are late bloomers and some of them are earlier. So. 
one of my favorites, but yeah, they do uh, take a little long, longer to get established. Well, great guys. I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming to us via Zoom from your homes uh, during this time and, and helping people uh, get more information about gardening, the thing that we all want to be doing right now and, and are starting to do. And it's, it's really rewarding. So uh, Deborah Erickson, Bob Olin, thank you so much. Uh, we want to tell people to keep an eye on our website and Instagram page for great gardening updates, examples, and episodes of our show and keep those questions coming in via email. Also, um, keep the faith. Spring is still bringing all its wonders during these trying times. Uh, from all of us here, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden. Funding for Great Gardening is brought to you by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.